Hi, everybody. I'm Karen Hartglass. It's time for another episode of It's All About Food. I'm here with my co-host, Gary DeVite. Hi, Gary. Hi, Karen. Sing it with me. Always look on the bright side of life. Okay. <laughs> Always enough of that. I've been playing a lot of that lately. How about you? How are you doing? Good. Well, you know, you know how that the, that song continues. Yeah. Yeah. We won't go there. We won't go there because that's what today is all about. March goes in like a lion and stays in. <laughs> Or comes in like a lion. We'll fix it in post. Right. Okay. But, but anyway. the sentiment is we're going to be in for April. That's right. We're <laughs> staying in. And hopefully at some point it'll go out like a lamb whenever that is. Yeah. Yeah. So here we are at Responsible Eating and Living Pandemic Headquarters. Pandemic Headquarters. And we're here with truth and tips and tools to help you and ourselves get through the next week <laughs> and the then next, we'll worry about the week after that yeah, day to day that's what we have to start it's all thinking, about right? day to day one Just day at living a time. one day at a time mindfulness last week we talked about meditation mm. going inside if you can't go outside going Remember inside that? if you can't go outside and i have to admit i have been meditating more often every single day you get up and you meditate yeah you, you are just the and then greatest. when I feel a little anxiety rising, like reading an article, and there's a lot of them to read, and some of them are more upsetting than others, most of them. Well, there's good news out there too. Um, but it's I, really I need about- I need the meditation to kind of go with go inside, yeah. calm the breathing, get a reality check on my current surroundings. And right. fortunately for us and for many people, even though there's something scary out there going on, um, if you're in a home and you have food, you're in a good place. Yeah. So everybody do what we do before we start a, a voice class or an acting class or a dance class. Everybody just take a deep breath in and yawn. Oh, yeah. oh. Open it up and relax. Everybody, deep yeah. breath. This, this program is called It's All About Food. And I think the programs that everyone is kind of glued to are the programs that would probably be titled It's All About Fear. So remember, a lot of this stuff is just to get you to read it. No fear here. No fear here. We're going to give you some good news about how you can occupy yourself during this really strange time. <laughs> really strange. I'm looking forward to some good news. Well, I mean, the good news is is that we've been talking on this show for many, many, many years. You have. This has been your mission. is to try to get people back into their kitchens. Find your kitchen. Find your kitchen, right? I've heard you say that many times. Yep. And now people have time. (laughs) They have time and we have fewer options for feeding ourselves. I mean, the reality is we either make our food at home. Or we order in right. with deliveries of prepared food, restaurant food, or food from scratch. Right. And so what this program is kind of loosely based on, and again, we're going to be riffing on all kinds of things. We have all kinds of stuff to talk about in the hour. But uh, what this program is going to be loosely based on is is um, not the order in part, not ordering the prepared food part of that thing that Karen just said, uh, but how to uh, prepare some of these foods that maybe you would like to have around but aren't able to get because maybe you can't get them delivered if you're staying in from your grocer. And I know a lot of vegans out there are really heavily dependent on some of these products that are already prepared. And so we're going to talk today about how you can make them yourself. Now, you're still going to have to do some digging. You're still going to have to find some of the the materials that you need to make these products, but I think in the end it will be worth it because you'll have a whole lot more in your freezer and in your pantry than you would have had if you just ordered one or two items at $12.95 for um, a, 
a little bit of butter. I think some of the simpler, less processed foods are more available than the prepared foods. Right, but a lot of folks need that. And that's that. where we can make the other things that we're used to, that we can't buy, those prepared foods right. that aren't available. We can make them from the simpler foods that are available. Exactly. Right. And you have been talking to people for how many years now? 11, 11 years. on this program. Hello. Cookbook authors. We're going to focus on some of the cookbook authors. And you've talked to hundreds and hundreds of them. And they have all been giving us great advice on how to do this stuff on our own. And, uh, for example, today I read a post about a little grocery store in Manhattan on the Lower East Side. I think it's in the East Village. It's called... Orchard Grocer. Orchard Grocer. And it's right next door to Moo Shoes. And they advertise that they're going to start delivering to all five boroughs. I think all five. Maybe four of the five. Or three of the five. Anyway, Manhattan... Queens and Brooklyn, definitely, they're going to be delivering to. And check out their website. At any rate, they're a little small, all-vegan grocery store, and they sell all of these products to that um, everyone else wants. Yeah, and most of it's prepared food, like vegan cheese and the vegan meats. And the vegan butters and the vegan mayos. And there's a lot of staples that they... They sell that. Uh, I went on the website just to check it out before uh, going on the air, and they're sold out of a lot of the things that people want. Yeah, so they'll deliver, but they're still out of a lot of things. They're out of a lot of, a lot of stuff. So, what's a person to do? Well, one of the great things about it's all about food with Karen Harklass and now and now Gary DiMatteo. Thank Karen you, Karen Harklass and Gary DiMatteo. Is that um, we've been talking to these people? We've got interviews for you to listen to that we're linking to the page and we're just going to start with some of these foods that people want and of course they're not the healthiest foods but hey if you're stuck and you have a family and you want to you know you want to offer vegan butter um the person who makes vegan butter and this is the type of person that miyoko is she's that she's the real deal the real deal uh, she put out a a book to tell you how to make all the things that all of the stores that carry her products are running out of, like the vegan butter. And the book is called The Homemade Vegan Pantry, The Art of Making Your Own Staples. And you could find other recipes online on sure. how to make vegan butter. There's a, numerous different variations. I know we've tried one or two, and we haven't made Miyoko's recipe yet. Because I just ordered one of the ingredients that you need for it, which is liquid lethicin. Right. Everyone say that quickly. Liquid lethicin, liquid lethicin. I can't even say it twice in a row. That's a great tongue twister. Uh, but uh, it's not the cheapest product out there, especially if you want to get it organic, which I do, uh, when it's not chemically processed with nasty organic chemicals like hexane. But uh, we got the clean version. Well, listen, we love Miyoko and we love her products. But her products aren't the cheapest out there No, either. and they're organic. And they're organic. Yeah. Right. She does it right. She but if you can't right. get it, you can get the ingredients right. to make it yourself. And it could be a fun thing to do. A fun thing for the whole family. Right. And, you know, the book is beautiful. And if you've got some time and you want to order a book, uh, we've got a few cookbooks to talk about today that are informative and gorgeous and wonderful to to leaf through and i'm sure you can download it if you don't want to buy the actual book i'm sure it's available in a digital copy i would have you know i would i don't know but maybe it but is anyway. but it is really nice to have the book and i'm not going to put any predictions out there like maybe we're going to lose the internet <laughs> right right so the hard copy would be but a hard copy is good to have a hard copy is good to have and um, so the recipe is awesome. She calls it glorious butterless butter. And it's essentially, I mean, she has this great cultured butter product out on the market. And um, it's essentially, she gives you different variations. And one of them is the cultured butter. And replace the non-dairy milk with a half a cup of plain non-dairy yogurt. 
All right, well, how do you make non-dairy yogurt? We have a recipe for non-dairy yogurt. Yoko has a recipe for non-dairy yogurt. And now that you have the time to get back into your kitchen, you can make non-dairy yogurt and Miyoko's glorious, butterless, cultured butter. Beautiful. I want to keep talking about that, but I'm going to take a quick little segue here and, and do a little yogurt commercial. Yeah. No, that's that was... <laughs> see how I set you up for that Yeah, segue? I love it. So I've been making yogurt for a long time. I've made many different kinds of yogurt. I've made yogurt from soy... I used to make yogurt from cow's milk a long time ago. Karen consumed cow's milk. <laughs> that's a long time ago. And and then I've made yogurt from soy milk. Well, that's when you were a vegetarian. Yeah, a long time ago. But now you're a vegan. Vegan for almost 32 years. Uh, but the concept of making yogurt is the same with any milk that you make yogurt from. And everyone can do it at home. And you don't need a yogurt maker. You don't even need a special dehydrator oven. You can just put your yogurt in the corner covered with a towel and let it do its mm -hmm. thing for 24 hours. Um we're lucky here at Responsible Eating and Living Pandemic Headquarters. Our oven has a dehydrator oven, has a dehydrator option, which I discovered about 10 years after owning this oven. Right. But we use it a lot. And I've been fine-tuning making yogurt. And, you know, the first time you make anything, it's not guaranteed to turn out great. So you have to practice. It's like crawling walking, running, everything takes practice. It's not rocket science. It just takes a little practice. And so even though I've been making yogurt for a long time, I'm still learning. But I just made the most perfect batch of cashew yeah. yogurt. And like you said, it's trial and error, right? I mean, you keep, I mean, some of the batches that you've made, we weren't sure if it was yogurt or cheese because it was really, really, really thick. thick. And we, but we enjoyed it. And the only thing you don't want to do is if it has a pink layer on top, you want to dump it. Yeah, and, because uh, you could be growing something other than the good bugs. You could be growing some so bad bugs. So the canning process is, you know, you have to make sure everything is boiled and um, Yeah, sanitized. so unlike making sauerkraut, for example, which has lactic acid and it kind of kills everything that's inside all the bad stuff. I mean, it's always good to work with clean utensils and clean dishes and clean jars but with as yogurt a rule, as a general as a rule, rule especially yeah. now yeah but not just now all the time and that's the problem but we'll get into that later. yeah we Is need that... to talk about hygiene but <laughs> i take a big pot of water and i put my four jars glass jars in the water i boil the water and, and i you boil the lids too. and i don't boil the lids because they're those um it's got that kind of plastic coating on the inside oh, right, of those right, ball jars right. and so i put them in warm soapy water and i really clean now, them we're learning a lot about soap and water soap and water is we're amazing uh you know who knew it was so well we knew we did we knew yeah and so then you put a clean towel out and when the jars are boiled you take them out i use tongs that are also have been boiled in the water at least the tips that touch the glass and i make sure nothing touches anything because i don't want to add dirty bugs to my clean jars and i rinse the soaped up uh, covers and put them on a clean towel and then here's the thing i really learned that i have to be careful about after I blend my soaked cashews with water, and I use a two to one ratio, so I'll take one cup of dried nuts, I'll soak them overnight in water, pour off the water and rinse the nuts, and this is either almonds or cashews, and then um, if they're almonds, I peel the skins, but cashews are easier because you don't have to peel them, and then I blend them with two parts water, so I had one cup of dried cashews, I had two cups of water, but I've usually been making two cups of dried nuts and four cups of water. And then I put them in a pot. And what I learned here is you have to do this slowly. I'm always in a hurry. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of these uh, expressions we have about taking your time how and how important it is. And now we have time. So I like to cook it on a medium. I don't want it to boil because cashews can get very thick. Yeah, it reduces down because we talked last week about how cashew milk and cashew cream reduce down faster than uh, 
regular conventional dairy cream, and but it's a good fat. Right. right. And you've talked a lot about the good fats. Now, I have a candy thermometer, yeah, and you so have to this measure. This is the good part, everybody. Listen closely. This is a good thing to do with a candy thermometer. Rather than make candy, you can make yogurt. And <clears throat> I wait until this mixture that I'm stirring regularly and heating slowly gets to 165 degrees Fahrenheit. If you're on centigrade, you'll have to do the conversion. But <laughs> <laughs> it's the temperature that's recommended to kill all the bugs. And once it's reached 165, I stir it around. I make sure it's uniform. All of the liquid is at that temperature for a few minutes. And then I let it cool down to 115 degrees Fahrenheit. So you've killed all the bugs, and now you're letting it cool down so you could get more bugs. The good (laughs) bugs. bugs. The good bugs. And then I always save a quarter cup of yogurt from the last batch. Kind of like a starter. Yeah, and I and what I'm learning is the starter gets better with each batch. So we right. started with a, a started, commercial yogurt. Right, we did. We started with Forager. Which is pretty good. Yeah. But it's been, it's like getting its own. Right. Anyway, um, you add that, stir it in, and then pour it into your clean jars, cover it, and then we put it in the oven at a dehydrator option of 110 degrees. If you don't have a dehydrator or a yogurt maker, you can just put them in a place in the kitchen that's not too drafty. Cover it with a... A turned off oven. You could. Yeah. There's lots of options. Maybe you turn your oven on, let it cool down a little bit, and then stick it in there. Right. But it's going to be sitting there for eight hours. So, right. So... Um, at least eight hours. Now, I do it for eight hours at 110 degrees. If it's not in a warm environment, it may take 24 hours. Right, and then I'm you sure. open them up and you make sure it's nice and pure and white inside. And if you see any other color. I'm okay. sure you can find online a way to do it as well. I mean, I'm thinking now just off the top of my head, there's got to be somebody who's, you know, using a cardboard box and a heating pad or something. Oh, yeah, there are. Uh, you know, there there's got to be some way. And now that you have the time... You can uh, find it. You can um, experiment with it. Yeah, but I love making yogurt. And the yogurt... let me ask you a question. What if somebody doesn't have a starter? Can they use like a capsule of some sort of... Uh, yeah, they'll have to buy probiotics. Probiotics, because that's what we're talking about here. And it has to be a probiotic that's fresh and live, because some probiotics people buy are kind of dead and they don't... Okay, Pro. so again, you have the time to check out what what's the best probiotic to yeah. use. Yeah, so if you have probiotics in pill form, the best thing to do is take two small cups of plant milk. You could use this with cow milk too, but we do it with soy milk. And you put a capsule of probiotic in one cup, like a quarter cup of milk, and... Uh, you just leave them for 24 hours and you come back. It's a science experiment. <laughs> you see. Covered? Would you cover them? Yeah, you could. doesn't matter. So in a jar, for example. Yeah. And then the one with probiotics should show some life, some foam, some bubbles, and the one kind not. like when you're proofing yeast for bread. Yes, but this takes a little longer. A little longer. So if the two cups look the same after 24 hours, you don't have a good probiotic. Right. So one cup is your... Your control. Your, control. Yeah. And the other cup is... Yeah. It's wonderful. Um, now, again, if you have any questions, uh, info at realmeals.org. Talk to Karen. She is an expert. And on that subject, we're going to segue into what is an expert and what isn't an expert. <laughs> okay. And then we're going to get back to making butter in the cookbook. Yeah. We've yeah, got a lot okay, to talk cool. about, but we have a whole hour and, you know. Um, but anyway, Karen's an expert. Thank you, Gary. So you can trust that she is. She knows what she's talking about. So talk to Karen and ask her any question you have about this subject we're talking about now. And I'll be honest with you. If I don't know the answer, I'll You'll say I don't know it and I'll find it. Exactly. That's the most frustrating thing, isn't it? When you're talking to somebody and you ask them a question and they don't know the answer, but they pretend like they do and they just yeah. blabble and say anything. I just read a great piece about that. and I won't get into any bad news, but... Uh, We are in this position right now because we stopped listening to experts and started reading comments from people who don't know much (laughs) on Facebook. Uh, But anyway, that's another subject for another day. 
So some of the other things that people are running out of and, um, you know, another thing is I've, I've talked to a lot of folks, vegans and non-vegans alike, who use these vegan products like vegan butter. You know, my family loves this vegan butter product with their, you know, flesh and uh, <laughs> things of that nature. So, um, and a lot of them are complaining because they can't get their vegan butter and they can't get their vegan mayo. And again, I went on the, um, the website we were speaking about earlier to see uh, if they had any of this vegan mayo, and they were all sold out of that too. And so let's talk about vegan mayo. There's a lot of great recipes out there for vegan mayo. And in Miyoko's book, and again, this show is, um, is linking you to interviews that Karen has done with some of these great cookbook authors who are also personal friends of hers. And so they will not steer you wrong. Karen will not steer you wrong. We also have a video. Miyoko is the real deal. Okay. And, um, and yes, we also have our own vegan mayo recipe and a video um, of me showing you how to prepare it at the Responsible Eating and Living website. And it's, it's, a, terrific, um, it's a terrific video. And I've even had people like John Robbins and Dale Robbins tell me that they make my recipe and they love it. So uh, that is like the ultimate compliment. But uh, Miyoko has a, a, a recipe here in her uh, cookbook. Again, I'll read you the title, The Vegan, the Homemade Vegan Pantry, The Art of Making Your Own Staples. And no, not the staples you use to... Uh, <laughs> to, to group paper together paper uh, <laughs> staples that you need in your pantry hopefully we won't get to that point where we have to make our own staples right for paper for paper yeah. uh-huh. but yeah. um, hopefully not but uh, she has some great recipes for for mayo as well and one of the really beautiful recipes that she has in here with respect to mayo is an oil free um mayo where you use cashews instead of oil and as we said before cashews are high in fat but it's a good fat and um, so she's got the different variations for um, mayo as well and she has recipes for mustard and she has recipes for soy milk and you oh, like her recipe because yes well thanks to one of it's all about foods listeners who directed me back to this cookbook, which I forgot I had and didn't realize it had a soy milk recipe. I learned the one essential thing about making soy milk that you cannot find anywhere else on the internet when people talk about making soy milk. And that is you do not underline, do not soak your soybeans before making milk because it'll take taste and smell like paint. Right. And, and Miyoko true. discovered this. Right. You put it, put your beans right into the hot water, cook them for a minute, and then you can blend them. Then you can remove the skins if you're so ambitious. And this goes out to uh, my cousin Nancy and uh, cousin Wade. Wade likes his uh, non-dairy creamer. And if you can't find it, Miyoko has a recipe mm. for almond milk and coffee creamer. So it's, um, it's that good kind of sweet... Uh, non-dairy creamer but it's a recipe because i know a lot of people are probably running out of that and the other cool thing is uh what else would you be running out of that you would want we already covered the uh but maybe you're, you you want some amazing cultured creamless sour cream now or, we use our yogurt we use our yogurt as sour cream as sour cream but some people want you know something that and I mean, she's, it's, she's got all kinds of great stuff in here. And the cool thing that I'm getting to is the item that seems to be selling out the most is her cheese. And this cookbook, or vegan cheese in general, and this cookbook has lots of recipes for vegan cheese based on Miyoko's recipe, which a lot of people are buying her cheese. She also has an earlier cookbook called Artisan Vegan Cheese. Right. And we have done a variation of it on our website of um, all these great cheeses using almonds and uh, Karen has made some amazing cheese and uh, we've got a lot of great cheese recipes on our website and we have made a great mozzarella recipe on our website and we even have video showing you what it should look like um, so if you've got the time now you can make a lot of these products and um, 
We also have other cookbooks. You know, I just wanted to add, if you Google Miyoko butter recipe, I'm someone sure has online. posted it. I just found it. Yeah. Yeah. But the book is really wonderful. It's good to have the it's book. It's good to have. But yeah, I'm sure you've probably already found it just by listening to us. Another link, another interview of, of Karen's that we're going to link you to is um, Nava Atlas's cookbook. And um, we are also going to link you to Joanne Stepaniak's cookbook. And that's called The Saucy Vegetarian. Yeah, let's jump into Joe uh, jo Stepaniak because she is one of the four people, four four fathers, four persons. Right. She's been around and she's been making be- vegan food for a long time. Yes. Uh, and she came out with this book, I don't know, it's 80s, the, 90s? It's called The Saucy Vegetarian, Quick and Healthful No-Cook Sauces and Dressings. Yeah, it's really easy. All you need is a blender and you don't need a high-powered blender for these recipes because I think this cookbook came out before the high-powered blenders existed. Right. So we're balancing here with, um, we, we opened with Miyoko's cookbook. And we'll get back to Nava in a second because we're talk, we'll are we leave her for desserts. But um, now we're giving you something that's really simple. simple yeah, so stuff. the idea is that you're at home. You're making food. You're going out of your mind because you only have a repertoire of a few recipes you like to make. You want to make food taste better. Maybe you don't have all the ingredients you want to have. But if you can make a variety of sauces. To put on to stuff. To put on stuff. Put on your rice and beans. It opens up. A whole new world. And it doesn't take much to change the flavor of some of these sauces. And so this little book gives you wonderful ideas. Yeah, almond miso dressing, lemon nut dressing, mustard peanut sauce, basil red pepper sauce, umbiashi, plum, um, vinaigrette. And when you mention miso, that reminds me, Gary, that we need to run over to south river miso's website and order some more miso yes because they have the best miso yeah it's they, organic. they only ship at certain point, times of the year so you right gotta get to you got to get bef- before it gets hot because right. they don't ship in the hot weather right they, she has an instant alfredo sauce recipe um again peanut chili whip i mean it's a great book and it's as she says she stresses in the title quick and healthful Health, not help. Healthful, no cook sauces and dressings by Joanne Stepaniak. There's another beautiful cookbook. I know a lot of fe- folks are saying, oh, I'm running out of my, you know, my stores don't have any more of my vegan uh, field roast sausages and field roast um, roasts and things like that. And for those of you who like field roast, here's another person, Tommy McDonald, like Miyoko who could easily not give the recipes out to his secret um, sausages and things that are so wonderful and people are buying off the shelves. But he went ahead and said, no, I'm going to make it available to people who want to cook. And so Tommy McDonald has a book out. He's the guy from Field Roast. Karen has spoken to Tommy, and we're linking the article. And it's called 101 Artisan Vegan Meat Recipes to Cook, Share, and Savor. And the book, again, like Miyoko's, is gorgeous. And he's got not only recipes for his, his uh, burgers and his sausages and his Benedict and his lox. He makes a tomato lox and cream cheese. Um, a, a tomato lox as in tomato lox and cheese, which is unbelievable. Biscuits and gravy with spicy sausage and corn. Uh, just, you know, amazing stuff in here. And if you've got the time... You can learn how to make your own um, meats out of grains, grain meat grind, and you're just going to need some um, something to um, some cheesecloth and some kitchen string, and that's a little easier to find these days than some of these products that Tommy <laughs> has developed. So, with that, and we'll get to the holidays last. The other cookbook we're going to link you to is for desserts, and it's called Vegan Desserts, Sumptuous Sweets for Every Season, 
Anna Kaminsky. Now, I'm sure a lot of people are having serious withdrawals these days because they can't get their latte and they can't get their piece of cake right. at their local cafe or whatever it is. It seems like the entire world is baking cookies. I, I said that I think, <laughs> last week. But this book is beautiful. Cheesecakes and cookies and coffee cakes and spicy beet cakes and Samoa tarts and mojito sugar cookies. And it's broken up into seasons. But I mean, is there ever really a, is there a season now? I mean, we're sort of seasonless, right? But um, yeah, the home season, the stay at home season. Apple cobblers and berry cobblers and how to make your own vegan ice cream and um, so many wonderful things in Hannah's book. And I'm sure, again, as Karen has mentioned, you can find a lot of these recipes online. You may have your own that you'd like to share with people. But if you're really interested in doing some reading and some cooking and um, some learning, you've got the time now. And here's these are some great resources. And they're based on things that you're already maybe buying, as with the Miyoko book and with the Field Roast Tommy McDonald book. Um, and there's, you know, Karen has talked to millions and millions of people. I mean, not, you know, millions. not millions, but, but a lot of people. But, and all these, you know, we can't talk about desserts without talking about our dear friend Fran Costigan, who is the queen of dairy free. The diva of dairy the free, diva. the author of Chocolate Vegan Chocolate, such a beautiful cookbook. And another one, if you're, if you want to dig in and make some of your own desserts. Because we're running out of chocolate. So people are going to want to talk about Fran's book and make some chocolate. Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. So we'll have to link to that interview. Or Absolutely. Link to Fran as well. Yeah, we have a little chocolate recipe that I like, which is just cocoa powder, sugar, and uh, coconut oil. And it makes a nice ganache. But I'm thinking of revamping that because I'm always revamping and purifying or cleaning up recipes. And I'm making things without sugar more and more. I mean, we don't eat sugar, but occasionally in some of the treats we have sugar. And we just bought an 11-pound box of Medjool dates. Yeah, dates. And I am going to be revamping some of our sweeter treats using dates right, instead and this, of sugar. One of the things that you do and um, that I really like is you make a date paste and we just add a little teaspoon of that in our tea sometimes and it's very, very Russian. Very yummy, very <laughs> Russian. <laughs> I feel like I'm in a checkoff play every time we do that and I'm looking for the samovar. But um, So the holidays are coming up. We have, right. we have Easter holiday and Passover holidays and they're about coming up, up around the same time. It's funny how they do that. And uh, I'm thinking about Passover, especially because of two things. One is, if you're familiar with the biblical story of the Jews in, enslaved in Egypt, and they want to get out, and Moses is their hero, savior, and he keeps negotiating with the Pharaoh, let, let my people go, you know, let them out. And uh, the Pharaoh says yes, and then he says no, and yes, no. And two things happen. One is... God brings 10 plagues on the people of Egypt. And uh, God. <laughs> thank you. Oh, God's here with us on It's All About Food. Uh, How guys, are you today? You guys are doing great God. work. You're doing excellent work. And, <laughs> uh, and I just wanted to say I've tried some of these recipes you're talking about and they're fabulous. Anyway, uh, carry on, Karen. I'm sorry. I'll thank see you. You, later. you must have a lot of work to do. I've got to get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, the 10 plagues, it feels like we are being, um, we are, we now have a plague to experience, which is the coronavirus. It's like Interesting a plague. Interesting how that's, you know, we're timing that out with all of this. I'm sure the, the zealots out there are really having a field day with this. And so Passover is reminding me of the plague and the one that we're experiencing now. And when the Jews, after the 10th plague, the slaying of the firstborn, a lovely plague indeed, um, when they were leaving Egypt, they were in a hurry, as the tale goes. And they left without giving their bread time to rise. So they were all making their own bread and they left and they baked the breads on their back. How resourceful. And it turned out they to be what we now call matzah, which is just like a cracker. Wait, back up. They yeah. baked the bread on their backs? This is the story. Yeah. What? Wait, what? I mean, <laughs> I'm not very religious. so I, Okay, they, so. 
It was it was tough enough for me growing up Catholic and having to stare at a guy in his underwear bleeding, you know, on a cross. They didn't have time for the bread to rise. Uh, so I guess they the story goes they made their doughs or they had their doughs and they had to leave. So they baked them in the, the sun, sun on their back and uh, they didn't rise. They were flat. Because they didn't have anything leavening them, right? Well, I'm not sure. You know, it's I tough wasn't to find there yeast now too, so I can relate. But the that's that's the story we're told, and to remind ourselves of what happened in this time, we we eat matzah. Uh, I'm being facetious, and I'm not a big a fan story. of matzah because it's, it's usually made from white flour, and uh, it leaves you constipated. <laughs> it's it's just a story. I get it. It's a good story. And a lot of the rules in Passover, they are not very vegan friendly because they don't let you eat beans and rice. Unless you're Sephardic, there are some loosened rules because it's such an important staple in the Sephardic diet. Anyway, it's nice to tell these stories and have some traditions, but it's also important to stay healthy and eat the foods that are good for you. But I'm thinking now that the importance of doing it yourself and making do with what you have is what I'm getting at. And that's what this holiday reminds me of. That's really wonderful. And so there's going to be a lot of vegans out there and people who maybe don't want to eat meat over these holidays because they realize that eating an undercooked bat is not a good thing and can cause a pandemic. Yeah, um, not a good thing. But, but not also the Atlas. eating undercooked chicken and eating undercooked anything that was once living and carrying diseases. And then when you ingest those things that they were diseased with, you become diseased too and possibly spread it to other people. I'm not an expert. Let me make that clear. I'm just you know, processing this information for myself. But there are lots of wonderful recipes for these vegan holidays in some of these cookbooks where you have interviewed some of the authors. Yes. And we, oh, we've pulled out two of them. Two of them. And one of them is the um, vegan holiday cooking from Candle Cafe. Oh, yeah, and I have adapted one of their recipes in this book that I use for Passover or um, just because I love it, and that's the flourless chocolate cake. Oh, it's delicious. You have to make that. Yeah, it's gluten-free, and it's really yummy. This cookbook is by Joy Pearson, Angel Ramos, and Jorge Pineda, and it is um, not only are they friends of ours, along with Bart Potenza, and they owned all of the... Uh, candle restaurants in Manhattan, which now we're only down to the Candle Cafe, which is why we picked this. You still can go to, to Candle Cafe. Well, you can well, not get now. delivery, probably. You can get delivery. But uh, hopefully someday we'll be able to go back inside Candle Cafe because it's it was one of the first restaurants that I fell in love with while falling in love with you, Karen. Uh... And so it has a really special... And I know that when you were going through cancer, Joy was one of the key individuals who said to you... Love heals. Love heals, because she saw you and I together. And thought, I just knew I was going to be okay when she said that. And that was at Candle Cafe, if yeah, you remember that. We I do. We were sitting in a little table on the wall, and she said... She, meet, she met me for the first time, and she looked at you and I, and she said, Love heals. <laughs> And that was, oh, that's joy. Pure yeah, joy. Yeah. And I hope they're doing well. I want to shout out to Kendall. Anyway, they have holiday recipes and they have a section on Passover. And they do this um, this incredible brisket. And now, again, we're talking about gluten. And I know a lot of people don't eat gluten. But um, there's two issues with this brisket on Passover. We're not supposed to be consuming gluten, gluten or or uh wheat products that haven't been blessed and turned into matzah so making a seitan like this is not really kosher for passover but for those who don't really follow it strictly and want to have a brisket like recipe because brisket is a popular meat dish that's served them on passover yeah this is great it's amazing recipe and um uh, you know i have a i have a, a comment to make about that is it better to slaughter a defenseless animal and cook it or maybe just get some gluten and make a seitan roast? Okay, yeah. I, I, I don't answer the question. Yes, you just Like asked. a good playwright, you just ask the question. I leave it to you. 
do you want to go slaughter an animal and then cook it? Or do you want to just make something that's simply like making a loaf of bread? Mm-hmm. Only with some different flavors. Beautiful, Gary. Okay. I'm not going to answer the question because I'm not here to judge. <laughs> okay? I'm just here to talk about food. Yeah, you're good. <laughs> I could answer the question. No, I won't. <laughs> The recipe, though, is what I'm getting at. It's called Joy's Grandma's Seitan Brisket. And I love it. With roasted carrots, shallots, and turnips. And I'm making it for Passover. I'm not going out and killing an animal or contributing to the slaughter of animals. I'm going to just oh, make some flour. I know what I'm going to make. What are you going to make? I'm going to make my mother's vegan chopped liver. Oh, I totally yeah. forgot we about it. We haven't had Lewis. it for so long. And the recipes at Responsible Eating and Living, right. it is very easy to make with yellow onions, string beans, preferably fresh, although we have made it. Don't tell my mother. Oh, have to make a we lot have of that. made it with frozen string beans. And it came out great with frozen string beans. Olive oil and walnuts. That's it. And salt. Uh, but it's really a, an excellent recipe. And I know many people who love chopped liver, which is a Jewish pate. Uh, and they have gobbled up this recipe and loved it as yeah. much or a bit more. It's delicious. It's all about the sautéed caramelized onions. Yeah, you got to make the. You got to make sure those onions are caramelized. And um, again, you know, this isn't the healthiest food out there, but uh, for a nice celebration indoors <laughs> with you and your Zoom family or your family <laughs> on Zoom. And, you know, we should have bought stock in Zoom, right? I haven't bought stock in anything, but uh, it's, uh, it's kind of... I a- want to put it out there that I think the founders of Zoom should be should win a Nobel Peace Prize. I do, too. Because they are making such a profound difference for everyone right. globally. And they have made their service, their unlimited service, free for educational outlets K through 12 so that people can teach online... All these kids that are stuck at home. It's just an amazing platform. Yeah, I just started teaching classes online. um, Some theater classes for Playful People Productions. And they went really well. I had my first Zoom class ever on Saturday. And I'm looking forward to my next Zoom class. Anyway, Easter. I'm the resident uh, former Catholic here. Um, Easter was always a big deal in our family and um, growing up and you know chocolate was everywhere on Easter morning and and um, and your mother used to leave little bits of carrots by the Easter basket you told me yeah because we would lay out carrots like you lay out cookies for Santa Claus and then and uh, but we would lay out carrots and celery for the Easter Bunny because rabbits are vegan and um, (laughs) And the carrots would be gone, but what she would leave were these little, uh, little chopped up pieces of carrot to make it look like the bunny had eaten the carrot right there and wasn't very tidy. Ah. Uh, it was in a hurry. Yeah, and I would sweet. Wake up. We would wake up and go, "Why are these little bits of carrot here?" Well, the Easter bunny wasn't was in a hurry and didn't have a time didn't have time to clean up after eating the carrots. I mean, the deception. <laughs> <laughs> Did you believe that when you of were course. really young? Oh. The deception of parents is a beautiful thing in a situation <laughs> like that. All right, so they have this great Easter brunch menu, and it's got everything. A candle royale, a acai mimosa, a fair mary. I love that. A fair. So we're talking about drinks now, folks. We're talking about cocktails. Candle royale is, uh, oh my God, it's just this beautiful... Three ounces of cassis, sparkling wine. It's beautiful. Acai mimosa. They sound healthy, don't they? A fair Mary instead of the other name for a a drink with tomato juice and vodka. I like that. Fair Mary instead of... Bloody Mary. Bloody Mary. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Fair Mary. That's so... I mean, right there. Oh, I love Bart and Joy and that whole loving, peaceful image that they have. The candle Bloody Mary has a good spicy kick of sriracha sauce and is a very popular eye-opener at our weekend brunches. I mean, that sounds so good right now. Let's have Fair Marys for... uh, (laughs) Yeah, and everybody can come over. (laughs) Yeah, on Zoom. On Zoom. 
One and a half ounces of vodka, two ounces tomato juice, one half ounce fresh lemon juice, a teaspoon fresh thyme leaves, fresh thyme leaves. Well, if you can't find them fresh. You can use dried. You can use some dried, a little, little, a little sprinkling of dried thyme in there would be fine. Um, a quarter teaspoon freshly peeled and grated horseradish, dash of sriracha sauce. And again, what if you don't, what if you can't get sriracha sauce? There has to be a recipe somewhere online and you have talked to someone who has a recipe for sriracha sauce, I'm sure, in one of his cookbooks. We have a recipe at responsibleeatingandliving.com. That's right, we do. Yeah. And it's a wonderful recipe. Horseradish. Um, I don't know. What do you do if you can't find horseradish? You mean the root horseradish root or the condiment horseradish? You know, the, the, the prepared the condiment. The prepared you condiment. Yourself, so you right? make it yourself. You get the root. And it's easier today to find the produce than it is the condiment in some cases. Right. And I would say if you can't find horseradish, you probably can find wasabi powder. Mm-hmm. And for a kick. For mm-hmm. a kick. And so uh, do that. You know, and salt and pepper if you want that and ice and you got it anyway they they have this great brunch recipe in this book but you know if you don't want to go out and buy the book you can make your own they have coffee cake muffins spring vegetable salad with fava beans fava. we have some good brunch recipes at responsibly yes, living.com where you make a uh, eggs benedict in hollandaise no eggs benedict no of course no eggs benedict arnold that's <laughs> no what it's called eggs benedict arnold. and there's a vegan and there's a video and I made it for you for Valentine's Day, and now and now it just crosses over into all the holidays. Of course, it can work for any holiday or any special day or just to stay at home, make brunch day. Transition Kitchen, Episode 2. Check it out at ResponsibleEatingLiving.com. You'll see me making Karen uh, Eggs Benedict. Mm. No oh. Eggs Benedict Arnold, which is basically um, an Eggs Benedict without the eggs, and it's... Uh, it was a lot of fun, and Karen filmed it, and I made it, and then she came on camera afterwards and ate some of it and said it was good. It was good. Yeah. Make me more. I will. And my birthday's coming in up in April, so... And we're going to have a Zoom party, because it's on Earth Day, Woo! and you're all invited to our Zoom party for Karen's birthday, but we'll talk about that later. Anyway, this vegan holiday cookbook is wonderful from Candle Cafe. There's one more that we're going to talk about, Nava Atlas's... Vegan Holiday Kitchen. Nava Atlas has been putting out wonderful cookbooks for a long time. She's also posted many recipes online. She's a lovely person, an artist, very creative, and has wonderful recipes. So one of the ones that I like for Passover is her matzo ball soup. And I've made the gluten-free version, which requires quinoa flakes. And that's like I'm blowing my mind right now remembering I should buy some quinoa flakes. Yes, we need some quinoa I got to find them. We got to find them. We got another. We've got a lot of searching to do. Mm-hmm. I just want to read you the um, inscription in the book because she, was, she gave us this book. For Karen and Gary, here's to many happy and healthy vegan celebrations. Nava Atlas, December 2011. Oh, isn't that wonderful? It is. That's really wonderful. Wow. So thank you, Nava. One of my favorite recipes in this book that I haven't made, but it, it, the picture is just um, my mouth. You're licking the page. I'm licking the page. is chocolate orange cake, and I guess I'm going to have to make it. I didn't know you liked chocolate orange cake. But look at this picture. That's what I'm saying. The picture is just... It's a bunt. It looks like a it's bunt. It's a bunt. <laughs> <laughs> no meat? That's okay. We'll make lamb. Bunt. For those of you who don't know what we're talking about, there's a movie called My Big Fat Greek Wedding, and Andrea Martin's character, I mean, talk about a Nobel Peace Prize. She should win a Nobel Peace <laughs> Prize for everything she's ever done, because every time I watch her, I don't think about anything but uh, how wonderful life is through her genius. Artistry, her genius. And um, anyway, she has a thing about what she, the way she says bunt cake. But I digress. Yeah, Nava's cookbook, lots of beautiful recipes. Okay, I've babbled a lot. You have. You have done an excellent job, and we are down to about six more minutes left. Can you believe it? Yeah, so we've got some fluff stuff to talk about. Um, there's a lot of interesting things in the veg on the veg websites. One of them I really uh, thought was cool was uh, Jane Goodall. Um, was um, 
talking to people on a video, and she says, uh, and this was on the Veg News site. For those of you who know about people at Veg News, they are getting their magazine out, cranking it out. She's uh, Jane Goodall sends COVID-19 message, leave wild animals alone. You may want to check that video out. It's a video message from Jane Goodall. Can I talk about a couple of things that are a little a little serious? Yes. Yeah. Well, that's pretty serious. But yeah. go for it. Yeah, even more serious. Well, no, not more serious. Just more serious. Okay, I'm going to stop. Here's another serious subject. Right. <laughs> um, so many of us are not going to the stores and we're getting our food delivered. Yes. And we've got some incredible heroes out there right now. Our healthcare workers, the doctors, the nurses, the caregivers, the EMT drivers, the e- um, yeah, and and the grocery delivery workers and the grocery workers, and many of them do not have the masks, the sanitizers, the protective equipment that they need to stay healthy. And this is very serious, and now. Some of them are going on strike, and you may have heard about this, but I recommend uh, looking it up. So coworker.org, coworker.org, all one word, C-O-W-O-R-K-E-R.org. They are sponsoring the Global Retail Worker Sick Out, which is going on today with Whole Foods. And that's something to look into and support our delivery people and our grocery grocery workers need to have adequate p- protection. And it's especially frustrating when there are people like Jeff Bezos who have unlimited capital. I mean, he makes like close to $120 billion a year. He can find the ways, he can find the means to protect his workers and offer them health benefits if they unfortunately get sick. So this needs to change immediately. And Instacart is also um, getting hammered because now, they're not protecting Now, for those of you that don't know what Instacart is, what that's where the, somebody goes into a store and goes shopping for yes, you, Yes, right? it's a service. You see those people in the stores shopping for other people. So there are two kind of Instacart workers. There are the ones that go put all the things together in the basket, and then there are the ones that deliver it to you, and sometimes they're one and the same. Mm-hmm. But they need protection, too. Of course, they're not paid very well. Many of them are part-time, and they don't get health benefits. And this needs to change. So if you're using these services, I hope that you support the strikes and get these people what they need. Yes, I agree. I just think it's ridiculous, and I'm sure everybody else does, too, out there, that we are so unprepared mm. with mm. masks mm-hmm. and essential equipment like this that we let that slide and we had all of the warnings. And of course, you can just keep, you know, belaboring and belaboring and belaboring and just fussing over this. But I just want to keep it on an up note. I talked last week about a friend of mine. Elizabeth Townsend Gard, who is a law professor at Tulane University. And there's a great piece in the Tulane University news about Elizabeth, uh, a law professor and a truck driver joined to make a million masks a day. Mm. And there's a picture of Elizabeth at her sewing machine. And remember, I mentioned last week that she's a quilter and she and her husband, Ron, both teach law, I believe, at Tulane. Anyway, it's a great piece about how This is happening. People are, you know, people like Elizabeth and and um, other companies out there are retrofitting their businesses to uh, to help the healthcare workers and people stay alive while they're helping us stay alive. Yeah, this should have happened two months ago, spearheaded by the federal government, but it didn't. And another one, a shout out to um, Brooks Brothers. You can check that out in the news. Brooks Brothers, the makers of shirts, they still have their factories, most of them at any rate here in the United States, and now they're making masks and gowns for hospitals and hospital workers. And uh, that's, that's a really wonderful, wonderful you know, shout out to You know, what's a little Brothers. frustrating, we have a, a nonprofit. It's called Responsible Eating and Living. The acronym is REAL. We talk about things that are real. 
And I want to say that this coronavirus pandemic is real. Mm -hmm. I've read stuff on the Facebook (laughs) where people are talking about it. And some people don't believe that it's real. And I wanted to explain a couple of things because I like math and this is about math. Ooh, I like when you get like this. (laughs) So I want to talk about the difference between the number of cases of coronavirus and the rate of coronavirus. So we talk about here in New York the rate of coronavirus, and it's been going up and going up and then kind of stabilizing. That's what we want it to do, stabilize and go down. But when the rate of cases goes down, it doesn't mean the number of cases are going down. It's just the speed of the change. Now, that's a mouthful. So let's talk in simple terms. Let's say there's two cases of coronavirus. And in 10 days, we have four cases. That means the rate is four cases in 10 days. And you do the math, four divided by 10. When the rate goes, when it goes from two cases to four cases in two days, that's a faster rate. It's increasing at a faster rate. It's increasing in less time. So what we want to do is slow that rate down and have the numbers double or triple in a longer period of time. They're still going to increase for a while, but more slowly. Because I've read some people, I posted it, I posted an article about how the rate in New York was slowing and somebody's like, no, it's not. There's still tons of people that are sick and it's two different things. And that's the point why we want to stay at home. We want to slow the rate. The same amount of people ultimately can get the virus, but over a longer period of time so that our hospitals can manage it. Very well done, Karen. Very well put. It's about the rate. It's about the rate. And people, because they aren't experts, and again, I'll just okay, repeat myself. Okay, enough with the experts. You're an expert. But that's a big deal. We're reading people's posts and they don't know what the hell they're talking about. Yeah, so... Just like we're listening to people who are supposed to be heading our federal government and they don't know what the hell they're talking about. So the best thing to do, folks, is boost your immune system, eat the healthiest food you can get your hands on, but remember to wash your hands before and after you touch your food. And remember to rinse your nuts if you soak them. <laughs> That's the other important lesson from this program. Rinse your nuts. Everybody repeat that. Rinse your nuts. You After you soak them, rinse them. Rinse them. <laughs> you're, you're silly, Gary. Oh, my goodness. Okay, we've come to another It's All About Food show. I hope you'd enjoy it. I know I have, and I can't wait to open some of those cookbooks and get cooking. Yes. Everybody. Yes. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Karen Hartglass here with Gary Dumite. Have, have a delicious, have a delicious week. week. Okay, bye everybody. Always look on the bright side of life. Everybody. Bye, Karen. Always look on the bright side of life. Bye.